Well, good morning again to you. I know many of you are probably surprised to see me up here. I'm surprised to some extent. I'm sure my wife and my son, and I probably have a proud mother right now watching in New Jersey. And instead of calling this a sermon, I'm going to call it Reflections, because even though I had a pastor take a look at it and said it was fine, and nothing sacrilegious and so forth, I feel I don't speak with the authority that they speak, so we're going to call it Reflections. So let me tell you how this came about. Do I have special training? No. Uh, am I going to read one of Pastor Jeff's sermons? No. So basically what happened was I, I, I'm a person who is a congregant just like you. Um, I've always been going to church and uh, right now many of you are aware I'm in the adult Sunday school class and Pastor Jeff and uh, Pastor Flanagan were in class and uh, they said, okay, George is doing okay with uh, Sunday school class. What damage can he do? So when Pastor found out he was going to be out of town, he asked me if I would be tempted to give the sermon. And I said, well, I'll think about it. And at the food bank where I volunteer, another friend of mine had given a devotion. And one of the things he talked about was how easy it is in the world for people to say no, especially when it comes to helping other people. And so he talked about how difficult it is to say yes. And so if you think about it, the disciples all had the same problem. And I thought about it, and I thought, well, my wife and I are very active as far as helping other people. She says yes all the time. So I thought, OK, I will say yes to this because it, it helps pastor. So with that being said, we're going to begin. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In our reading today, you recall we heard from Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians. And Paul thanked his people. He said, hey, you didn't have to do this, and I'm not commanding you to do this, but thank you for your generosity. Because in giving... Those gifts were in turn going to be used to help others. So many would argue that the gifts by the Corinthians would be considered what's called a blessing for others, and they would be correct. So what I wanted to look at this morning was I wanted to look at the words gifts, blessed, and blessing. Because we hear them all the time, and I was wondering, are they being used correctly? In some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. So you constantly, if you're like me, you see them on T-shirts, you see them, uh, in, you know, the readings from the Bible, bumper stickers, emails, the list goes on. Somebody sneezes, what do you say? God bless you. Or bless you. Okay. So anyway, I've always been inquisitive. I have a, a good friend who I've known for many, many years who calls me Curious George. And... <laughs> I have proof that I'm inquisitive. So this is what I amassed in going to Pastor Jeff's Sunday school class. So all of these are my questions that I had. And of course I would sit with my Bible and Jeff would very patiently try to answer a couple of them. But so I, I thought what I would do is instead of writing something about blessings, I would look into the blessings and we'd end up with a five-minute sermon. But the problem is, is that as soon as you look up uh, what blessings are, I just started getting a thousand questions popping into my head. Are God's blessings the same as a person's blessing? Are blessings related to spiritual things or material? Or possibly both? Are there strings attached to the blessings? Do I have to earn my blessings? Why do some people seem to be more blessed than others? And old, are Old Testament blessings the same as New Testament blessings? So you get, get the idea that, for me, the concept and topic of blessings is a tad confusing. And then here I am thinking it would be a safe topic, and you have to remember that most topics in the Bible are not safe. 
there are so many interpretations and there's so many people looking at how are they going to, how, what context were the blessings made and so forth. And to make things worse, Jesus spoke in parables. Jesus told people not to report things just like we heard today. Um, and to quote Paul, he said trying to understand Jesus and God and all the scriptures and so forth is like trying to look through a glass darkly. So even in even in Psalms, there's a reference that is made that says, you know, it, it's a good thing uh, to be confused by God, and it's a noble thing to try to look for the answers. And one of the reasons for the the mystery surrounding it is is that Jesus wanted to stimulate conversation. So you can talk about something and you can argue, and hopefully when you leave today, what will happen is you'll say, you know. I agree with George on what he said on this, but I don't know about this other stuff he mentioned later, so we'll see. If we do a quick check with Google, which is my go-to, blessed is used over 600 times in the Old Testament alone, 600 times. And the definition of a blessing is it is a gift, and it is often undeserved. So, in our Lutheran tradition, and I quote here, blessings are seen as gracious gifts from God, manifesting His love, mercy, and provision in our lives. They are not something that you can pursue through works or good deeds. Like salvation, they are given as a gift from God. And a true blessing has no strings attached. Another way to look at blessings is they are basically a prayer asking for divine protection or a small gift from heaven. A blessing is an extension of God's grace and often intended to prepare someone to receive God's grace. That's an important concept that I mentioned in that paragraph. Blessings are seen as gracious gifts from God manifesting his love and his provision in our lives. You are already blessed, and many of you are aware of your blessings. For instance, you have the love and support of family and friends, I hope. The satisfaction of meaningful work and the joy of serving others are all manifestations of God's blessings. Luther taught that even the most mundane tasks, when done in faith and love, are pleasing to God and are avenues of his blessings. Do all religions have blessings? No, there are only four. Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Angelican, and of course, Lutheran. Blessings can be secular. Usually when we bless someone, we're wishing them well without the intrusion of God. God, uh, so yes, lay people can offer blessings. Depending on which Bible translation that you use, if you're wondering what was the first blessing that you could, you could count on, one translation credits God blessing the animals when he created them. Another interpretation said that really God's first blessing was when he uh, blessed Abram before he became Abraham and said, I will bless you and your name will be great. So God tells Abram that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars. Are Old Testament blessings the same as New Testament? The answer to that is not really. Old Testament blessings from God typically dealt with flourishing. Think of Noah. Think of Abram. Okay. If God blesses you, it means you have been granted special favor, and that results in joy and prosperity. Old Testament blessings also dealt with material gifts, as we'll see in a little bit. We see in Genesis, Deuteronomy, and Proverbs, New Testament blessings are more of a spiritual gift bestowed by the gospel. And that's illustrated in Ephesians. What did Jesus mean when he used the word blessed? He meant it to mean to be fully satisfied and usually referred to those receiving God's favor or the Holy Spirit, regardless of circumstances. What about other people being blessed more than us? Because it's easy to look at what others have and think that, hey, 
I've been slighted in the eyes of God. The reality is that some of your blessings are easier to see, and many blessings go unrecognized for what they are. Our neighbors might have a larger house, a newer car, nice clothes, and so forth. However, material things for personal enjoyment are not considered to be a blessing. So you can rule those out. I'm reminded of the song that some of you older folk, uh, my age, of course, Fumi doesn't even know this song, but when we were Fumi's age, there was a young lady named Janice Joplin who made fun of people who thought that way. And one of her most famous songs was the one that she sang, Oh Lord, would you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all have Porsches, I must make a Benz. <laughs> so we need to remember that our blessings and the gifts that God is not Santa Claus. He's not a wishing well. What are the material <laughs> gifts? Well, your basic earthly needs, such as food, clothing, housing, education, and general well-being. The reality is that we are provided with what we need, not necessarily what we want. Add to the question, if you are praying for blessings, are you asking with the proper motives? Material gifts are categorized by the church as being what are called temporal blessings. In this respect, the consensus understanding, and by consensus I mean the majority of the biblical scholars uh, would state that the understanding is that God gives us all good things. We are all blessed, believers and non-believers. As Matthew says, the sun rises on the good as well as the evil. It rains on the just and the unjust alike. Often we become so accustomed to our material gifts, our temporal blessings that we forget that they are actually a blessing. Many times our friends or family or even strangers will see that our blessings uh, are numerous before we do. Sometimes it takes a long time to realize that what we thought was a curse just might have been a blessing. Maybe the, a life lesson changes perspective on this topic. So I'm going to share and care at this point. When I was younger, up until about seventh grade. You would never know looking at me now, but I was a chunk. And my mom was great in this regard because when I had to buy clothes, I had to suffer the indignity and the embarrassment of buying one size that was a euphemism for the fat kid. Do you remember what that word was? Husky. Husky. Okay. I was ashamed that I had to have husky, but my mom helped me through it. But I, I distinctly remember, you know, and when I was husky, nobody in America was fat. So I was a trendsetter. <laughs> <laughs> Ahead of the curve, as they say. Um, but anyway, I had an experience, and I, I really didn't think about this till much later in life, but what happened was, <clears throat> when I lived in Maryland, there was a swamp that was near our house, and it was just a wonderful place to play. And my mom and dad repeatedly said, do not go in the swamp. It is dangerous. Well, winters get pretty cold in Maryland, and I decided that I was going to take my faithful dog, Fang, who was like a little miniature Benzie, and probably 20 pounds, and we went walking through the swamp. And there was a railroad bridge, and it covered uh, I don't even know what the body of water was, but it looked like looked like a strong flowing stream of some sort. It was deep. It was about eight, nine feet deep. So I put my dog ahead of me, 20 pounds, and me probably 100 pounds heavier, five feet tall. Uh, we were walking on the ice, and I fell through. And the water was deep enough that I fell through exactly up to my shoulders. And mom, if you're listening, I probably did not tell you this story, but <laughs> my apologies. But I fell through up to my shoulders, and the, the dirt that I happened to land on was sloped down. If I had been out another foot, I probably would have drowned, because falling through that water 
in, in, into that frigid water. It was so cold, it took my breath away. I couldn't move. I couldn't inhale. I couldn't do anything. I stood there for a while until the shock wore off. And then I broke the ice going back to the bank. And eventually I got out and I went home. And I don't remember telling anybody about that story. Because I, I wasn't supposed to be there. But I thought about it, and I thought, well, maybe in some ways, if I look at perspective, that that was a blessing that I was overweight. Because think about it, I fell through the ice where I was able to stand. If I had been walking on it now, I'd walk out in the middle of the stream, and I'd fall in 10 feet of water. So the fact that I was overweight at the time, at that time, was a blessing for me. It saved my life. I had a second similar situation occur a number of years ago, and I was sitting at church, or sitting at the, the kitchen table, getting ready to go to church, and I lost my vision completely in my right eye. And it was like somebody had taken wax paper and put it over my eye. And I lost a little bit of vision out of my left eye, but I didn't think much of it because I suffered from uh, migraines. And that particular week had been an especially rough week for me because I had been, if you get migraines, you know, they make you nauseous, and I was nauseous, and I was miserable, and I was taking eight to ten aspirin a day, which weren't doing anything, but they became one of my food groups. So I'm sitting at the kitchen table, and I lose my vision. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I have lost my vision with my migraines before. A week or so later, after it did not clear up, I went to the eye doctor, and he looked in my eye, and he said, immediately, you need to go see your cardiologist. I said, why? He goes, I'm calling him now. He's a friend of mine, and I ended up having to go there. It turns out that what had happened was is that I have a heart issue, like many of you in here, and I had to have surgery. I had an ablation where they go in, and they go through your leg, your femoral artery, and they hopefully fix the electrical malfunction in your heart. And they did that for me. And the doctor said, you are cured. You are 100% to go. No more need for you to take your medicine. So I didn't. But the amazing thing about the human heart is the ability for the nervous system to regenerate. And it did. And it regenerated incorrectly. And so my heart was fluttering and fluttering generates blood clots. But because I had been taking 10 aspirin a day for about a week, my clots were micro clots. And they settled all through my body, I'm sure, but specifically the ones that settled in my retina caused me to lose vision. And the doctors and the nurses and my ER nurse friends and stuff said, you don't know how lucky you are. They put me on Eliquis, which dissolved uh, most of the clot in this eye, and I got most of the vision back, and all of the vision back here. But again, here's the situation. It, it, it's how you look at things. What had been a curse for me, and to some extent, I would argue it still is a curse today, actually probably saved my life at that time, and allowed me to, to do, you know, function as, as a member of society without uh, severe brain damage, I hope, and so forth. But um, it all comes down to perspective and a personal interpretation. Regarding gifts and blessings, we have so many that we don't even realize how many we have. I'm going to share with you another story. Many of you are aware that when I was at Woodward Academy, I helped to build a school in Zambia. Uh, it was a mud hut village the tribe or the Tonga, and the government provided schools, but only to grade at the time, to grade seven. And in the government schools, they had 60 kids a class, no books, no pencils, no paper, no chalk. So what you did is you learned for a year, and then at the end of the year, you took a test. And if you passed the test, you would be able to move to the next grade. If you failed the test, you could repeat the grade, but you had to go to a different school, which might be five, six, seven miles away. So often, the kids who failed ended up just 
being condemned to a life of having worked in the fields all day. So I had a kid, I was over at the Terra Nova school at the time, and I was looking around in my classroom and I noticed that about a third of the kids seemed to be wearing glasses, and I couldn't remember any of my Zambian kids wearing glasses, so I inquired and they said, well, if, if we think they need glasses, we, we take them to Mazabuka and we get them glasses. So I had checked with parents of my students and they taught me how to do vision testing and do the glasses and stuff. And they sent a kid to me named Rickwell. And Rickwell probably was about 15. And I asked him, I said, Rickwell, how's your eyesight? He said, very good, sir. I see like the eagle. I said, okay. So I got the vision chart out and I asked him what was the top letter. He couldn't even see the chart. So I kept bringing it closer and closer and closer. It turns out that Rickwell could not see beyond about this far away. But he was such a good student because he would listen so attentively and he would have beautiful penmanship and so forth. So I diagnosed him uh, as far as the diopter. I gave him a pair of glasses and he put them on like this. So he put them on and he immediately was looking around like, oh my gosh, I get to see the world for the first time. Then he took them off. So said it to me. He gave them back. And I said, Rick, what, what are you doing? And he said, why would somebody I know give me such a gift as this? Somebody I don't know. And I said, Rick, well, you're allowed to have the glasses. You can stay. And he said, but are you sure Terra Nova will let me stay? I'm the only person here with glasses. And I said, yes, they will work well. So I put my glasses on, he put his on, and we had our picture made together. So he was the first kid in Terra Nova to get glasses. But that stuck in my mind. Why would somebody I don't know give me such a wonderful gift? And I felt shamed because I thought Rick well. If I had not asked for these glasses, they probably would have ended up in the trash. We have blessings and we don't even realize how blessed we are. In our Lutheran tradition, the means of grace, namely the Word and the sacraments, are primary channels through which God's blessings flow to us. The preaching of the Gospel and the administration of baptism in the Lord's Supper are not just rituals, but their means by which we receive God's grace and blessings. When you're feeling like you deserve gifts, which, think about this, you don't. Jesus gave us a gift when he died on the cross. He gave his life to bless us with the gift of eternal salvation. But I didn't answer the question yet about why some people who seem to be very deserving people seem to be not blessed at all. Why is this? I think we already answered this question when we referenced Paul in his letter to the Corinthians. As Luke says, to whom much is given, much is required. I think we have a moral duty to help others at all times. And we need to do as the Corinthians did. And as Paul says, it's not a commandment, but I think we are expected to help others. If we're honest, I think we would admit that we would expect as much if the situation were reversed. We can accomplish this in many ways, and many people already do. You work in food banks, you work in shelters, you work in agencies that help the need. These actions would be considered blessings by those who benefit from them, and they are. So what have we learned today? that the topic of gifts and blessings is complicated. And we probably only scratch the surface of them with the time allotted. But I'm going to put a plug in for my Sunday school class. If you would like more detail or questions or answers, these are the kind of things we go over in my Sunday school class. So I'm inviting you to attend. We usually start about quarter to nine or nine o'clock. So, and if you have questions about today's reflections, Please come by and I'll be happy to answer it. But I'm going to close with a blessing from Numbers, which you know, and it is my favorite blessing. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and grant you peace. Amen. Amen.